should be gracious and welcoming to those around us who are uh, still struggling. It is uh, wonderful to see you here on this bright, sunshiny morning, this day that the Lord has made. We are here to worship Him and Him alone. And in this Lent, this season of Lent, we are walking through the words of Jesus Christ on the cross to remind us of those last words that He uttered before dying on our behalf. So as we get into uh, our service today, Keith is going to talk to us about the grace of a God who even in the midst of the suffering that he's taken on for us, offers paradise to those around him. So I invite you to take a few moments as the band plays to start our worship and prayer. Pray for open hearts and open minds for all that God wants us to hear during this hour. Pray that his name can be honored and that he can uh, rest upon our praises. to see you here. It's great to see you here on time. Hope no one uh, twisted an ankle springing forward this morning. Um, but my pastor Keith Wilmer, one of the pastors here, and we are thrilled that you're here to worship with us to celebrate uh, our Lord Jesus uh, this morning in this uh, season of Lent, in this season where we are uh, preparing ourselves for the uh, upcoming celebration of Jesus' resurrection at Easter. And many of us use this time of Lent to help us get uh, a little more focused, right? A little more uh, maybe disciplined in our study, uh, a little more, go a little deeper in our time with God so that God can be working, refining us, um, and drawing us closer to Him. So our series is going to be focused on doing this, drawing us closer to Jesus with the seven last words of Jesus. When Jesus was on the cross, there were seven different things that he uttered, and so we will be going through those week by week. Pastor Vicki is preaching in the chapel this morning on woman, here is your son, son, uh, here is your mother, and I will be preaching here today about today you will be with me in paradise. So we will ask you to uh, also join us on Tuesday Time Apart if you're interested. It's a great time uh, in this season of Lent to slow down, to uh, be reflective, to draw closer to God through prayer, meditation, beautiful music. So that's 7 o'clock every week during the season of Lent in the Bower Chapel. Uh, this week, we're hosting a very important discussion church um, about suicide prevention. Uh, in the last few years, unfortunately, our community has had both from some young people and some older people, we've experienced this as a downtown community, 
And so we as a church want to respond. We want to respond by acknowledging it, but also by training, by teaching people how to address it, how to respond to people who might be in that place where they're questioning. And so folks from the Chester County Suicide Prevention Task Force will be here on Wednesday evening of this week, and they'll be here again next Sunday. Uh, so please check page seven for details. Tell others, invite people, it is free. And uh, this is something that we really can't talk about enough. Um, we are blessed. We're a blessed church. Amen? And we are blessed to be able to offer uh, scholarships to young people who are interested uh, in continuing their education. And so applications are out for these scholarships. They're in the church office um, with an April 30th deadline. So details about this are on page 9. Um, but those scholarships, um, as I said, are available, so read about it, and if you know someone who might be interested, who might be able to apply, please let them know and have them uh, reach out. They'll be awarded May 17th as we celebrate Graduation Sunday. And then, uh, if you're interested in learning about our overseas ministry partners, there are a few different ways that you can do that this month, church. Um, there is a walk through Haiti on March 22nd here at Hopewell, where you can learn about our missions to Haiti. And then uh, April, early April, there's a Mosaic fundraiser that everyone is invited to. So you can read more about both of these events in your bulletin. And then we've been pushing this a lot the last few weeks. It's a really exciting time for us as a church, our reverse mission trip, which will take place March 27th through 29th. It's a time where we come together as a family to take care of this beautiful building that God has given us to use for ministry. So we come together to paint, we come together to fix, to clean, to make sure that whoever comes in this space uh, feels welcome, feels loved, feels like they are in a positive environment. So please come out. We had a great response last year, and uh, there's information on page 11. I'll say this. It is not only great uh, to work and get stuff done here, but it's a lot of fun. We always have a great time being together, working together. Um, and so please consider signing up. And then the last thing uh, I want to mention this morning is just uh, probably on your mind, on many people's minds, uh, the coronavirus that uh, has been spreading through our world and more recently has been hitting closer to home. And so we know that this is on a lot of people's minds. Um, the church will be continuing to talk about it and addressing it as things change. But we want to take a moment this morning just to stop and pray, right? Pray for those who are affected. Pray for safety of the church and those that we know and love in our community. So if you can pause a moment to pray with me, church. Good Heavenly Father, we give you glory and honor this day. And we uh, just lift up those um, who have been affected throughout the world by this virus. We pray for those who've lost loved ones, Lord God, that you would bring them comfort in the midst of their grief. We pray for those who are experiencing the illness now, that you would bring about healing uh, to them, to their bodies. And God, we pray for our communities, our church, our loved ones, Lord God, that as this continues uh, to, to spread and evolve, Lord God, that you would keep us safe, that you would bring a, a spirit of peace, Lord God, amidst what can be a stressful um, and anxious time uh, in our country, um, but that you would be with those, you would be with us, um, guiding us, leading us, protecting us, providing for us through this situation. We thank you, God, for your provision, your love, your grace, your mercy. In your name we pray. Amen. So let's continue to be mindful, church, as I invite you to greet one another. I would say, um, don't feel obligated to shake someone's hand if you're not comfortable, but you just look them in the eye and smile and say, it's good to see you. If you want to give a little elbow bump or a little fist pump or whatever you want to do, but uh, don't feel obligated to, to grab a hand if you don't want. But let's greet each other with the love of Christ this morning. <laughs> So, 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 so,
the key of life was on the Thank you. 
blackest coffee I've ever had in my life, eating roasted uh, stuffed peppers, and sharing, hearing their stories, their struggles, their longings to be in a place of comfort and safety again, missing their homes, us sharing about why we were there, our love for God and for them. But why I remember all this is as we were preparing to leave at the end of this time, one of the things that we heard repeatedly from these families that we built relationships with was, when you leave, remember us. Please remember us. Don't forget about us. Because you see, in their dire situation, their longing for more, they saw us as these Americans, right? And the sense that we were coming from this great, powerful, prosperous country, and that there must be some power that we as Americans could have to help them with our privilege, with our resource, to get out of this suffering into a greater sense of peace and security that we would be able in some way to save them from this current situation. And so church, this is what I imagine, right? That the criminal on the cross next to Jesus means when he says to Jesus, remember me. He recognizes that Jesus is not simply a great teacher, leader, revolutionary, but he is the Messiah, the one sent by God to bring about God's kingdom, that he is the Son of God. And so this as to be remembered is an acknowledgement of this power that Jesus has. And a hope that after they have passed, after they have died, that Jesus will use his influence, his privilege, his power to alleviate any suffering that might be waiting for them in the afterlife. He and the other criminal you see are in a desperate place, church. Because they're not only suffering in the immediate, but they have serious doubts about what life means for them after death. Now we don't know much about these two criminals directly from the text. The word to describe them in the Greek is karu, uh, kakurgos, which simply means wrongdoer, evildoer, criminal. The word over the years has been translated into thief, which is possible, right? We've heard about the two thieves. But it's highly unlikely that these two men were being crucified simply for petty theft. You see, people who committed crimes in the Roman Empire were typically not crucified. There were many punishments the Romans had, some more terrible than others, but nothing, nothing was worse than crucifixion. Nothing was more humiliating, more painful, slower, more barbaric. It was so terrible that Roman citizens were legally not allowed to be crucified. And it was taboo for them to even talk about. It was one of those things that they knew it happened and kind of knew it was necessary, but you never talked about it in Roman society because it was so horrible. Crucifixion was reserved most often for slaves and occupied people, foreigners, who the Romans had conquered. And it was a tool of both extreme punishment and torture, but it was really a tool church to send a message to the rest of the foreign community that they had conquered. That if you resist, if you defy our rule, if you try to overthrow your master, or if you try to overthrow our government, you will meet this ultimate, painful, humiliating fate. Church, it was meant to strike fear and terror into the hearts of people who were conquered. The crosses would lie on the roads leading into towns and were placed in high, visible places. The skull where Jesus is crucified is a hill along the roadside. So that as people would come into the villages or towns, they would get a clear, visible, and horrific vision of the power of the Roman Empire. They would hear the screams, see the bloody bodies, smell the stench, and get a clear message. And so fear kept people in line. Harsh judgment was used to keep the peace, to get people to do what they wanted them to do. And so we know, church, right? In Jesus' times, the Jews were regularly rebelling. All four Gospels tell us that Jesus takes the place of Barabbas, one who had led a revolution, one who had even murdered people in process. And so in all probability, these two people on Jesus' side were part of Barabbas' movement, or maybe 
They led their own and had been a part of the stealing, murdering, this revolution against the Roman Empire. And so this makes sense, right? Why it was important for them to put King of the Jews over Jesus' head. It was a message to the Jews that if you try to gain your own independence, if you try to create your own government, if you try to replace Caesar, this is what will happen. And so on either side of Jesus, in all likelihood, we have two Jewish men who have broken Jewish laws during their life. In this riot, they probably steal, murder, they cause result, revolt in order to gain some sort of worldly paradise. And there are two men who had failed miserably, who were in a complete state of abject rejection, humiliation, and pain. But not only is there a feeling of defeat and failure in this life for them, but I think there's concern, church, for the next life. For not only have they broken Jewish law, but they will be denied Jewish burial, where they can go through the purification rites. Because victims of crucifixion were buried in mass graves, Jews and Gentiles alike. And so they would be denied the sense of peace that would come from being buried in the traditional Jewish burial ground. And so it's with this fear, right? This desperation that this criminal reaches out to Jesus, reaching out with the belief that he's the Son of God, and this man who will enter into heaven, that he may be able to provide some sort of relief. And so church, it must be this incredible amazing surprise to him and his partner that when Jesus answers, he answers not simply that he'll remember him, not simply that he'll think about him or maybe alleviate or find a place for him, but he says, you will be with me in paradise, that you will be brought into the glorious garden of Eden, a place free of sin, of pain, of hurt, that I will bring you along with me into this place of perfect beauty, perfect peace, perfect provision, and perfect love. You see, church, there's no greater place of honor in all the world, in all the universe, than to be in this place of perfect peace, all suffering gone, elevated alongside God. It's an incredible promise that goes ever against everything that this man was taught. And against a lot of what we're taught too, right? That people get what they deserve. That those who do good in life get good rewards. That those who follow the law are the ones who are successful. And yet here, right? We see this man who's made countless mistakes, broken numerous laws, who's failed miserably in what he's tried to accomplish, who's ended his life in this most humiliating way, he's promised a place alongside Jesus in paradise. You see, church, this is the new law that Jesus brings to the dismay of the Pharisees, to the dismay of the religious order, the law of undeserved love, the law of grace. And what an incredible comfort and relief. In church, it is for me, I hope it is for you, an incredible comfort and relief to us as we struggle, right, to do the best that we can in this life that Jesus operates by different rules than the rest of the world. That grace covers our mistakes, our failures, our crimes, our sins, and allows us eternity with God but also allows us to feel his unconditional love and acceptance even here and now if we will put our trust in him. And I think this is important, church, that the promise of paradise isn't just for eternity after we die. I believe that when Jesus says to the criminal, you will be with me in paradise today, that he knows the criminal is going to die, but that we today can experience paradise that it's true for us, too, that as we are open to the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Jesus, that we can experience that divine love here on earth. That as we acknowledge Him as God, choose to follow Him, that we become a part of His family, 
and can experience a bit of paradise ourselves, that we can get a glimpse of what is to come. And church, I'd like to give you an example of what this can look like in our day and age. Many of you, or maybe some of you, have heard of a woman who lives in our community, Erin Selcher. She lives here in, uh, I think, Guthriesville, in this community. But all five of her kids have gone through Hopewell Preschool. One of them is still in attendance. And I want to share her story today because it's a story that was presented to me, that was shared with me, and as I was invited to read her blog, to read her testimony, it's a testimony that God has used to draw me closer to Him, has used to inspire me, has used to bless me. And so I want to share it with you with the hope that it will bless you as well. I don't know her. But I reached out to her through Pastor Vicki to see if I could share her testimony, if it would be okay. And she said this, I'd be honored. It's God's story. It's not even mine. Thanks for asking, though. And so I want to share with you a picture of the power of paradise, how this idea of paradise is influencing her now and how it's influencing and how she's even experiencing it, her, it now in her life. So Erin Selcher is a 39-year-old mother of five children, married to Steve Selcher, who recently were living busy lives, as many of us do, and on January 21st, 2020, she was admitted to Chester County Hospital after experiencing severe abdominal pain. And then on January 24th, she was given a diagnosis church of stage four cancer. 39, five young children. Stage four cancer. There is no stage five church. Stage four is the most severe. And statistics will tell you that only 18% of people with this diagnosis live through the first year. And so on February 3rd, she started her fight chemo every two weeks for 12 weeks. And she says this in her blog, life is hard, right? Marriage is hard. Kids are hard. Juggling and finding balance in life is impossible. This is no secret. And then enters cancer. With this kind of diagnosis, there are many ways that a person could go. I've often thought about how I would respond, right? Despair, anger. Rage, helplessness, depression, self-pity, anxiety, self-absorption, etc., etc. And while Erin Church has shared that in the face of this diagnosis, she's experienced each of these different things at different times, what's amazing to me and those around her is how her attitude and her whole persona is categorized by hope and by love because of her faith in Jesus and her belief in and her experience of paradise. She and her family have come up with a slogan for their fight to rally support. Listen to this. Wage hope. Victory either way. Victory either way. Incredible. Where does one find hope, encouragement, love in the midst of such a dire diagnosis? The promise that either way, there's victory. That overcoming cancer means life in this world with her friends and family can continue victory. But if she doesn't overcome, she still has victory because she will be with God in paradise, the beautiful, perfect garden of Eden. She explains it this way. In January 31st post, she says, I do know for a fact in my heart that I will also have victory after this life on earth. I will walk those golden streets holding hands with my God. This gives me so much comfort. And then on March 5th, she wrote, Now I think it's easier to be the main character, especially if you believe that after life on earth, heaven awaits and is a place that exceeds all expectations. I am not scared of death. I'll fight, I'll pray. I'll even plead to God to stay on this earth as long as I can, but 
I'll also rest in him, for he's worked it out already. Church, there is incredible peace, strength, contentment in the face of suffering that comes from knowing that after this life is a glorious life with God and a perfect community of love. It's an incredible witness. But I think what is even more moving and incredible to me as I read her posts is how much through this experience Aaron is experiencing this beautiful kingdom of love, this tasting paradise right here and now. You see, when we join with Jesus, we allow that divine love into our lives and, and surround ourselves with those who possess that divine love. There is not only promise for the future, there is the promise that things will change now, of experiencing this divine love now. Erin shares that as she has been battling, an incredible community of love has come around her. She shares in January 31st post, people have prayed for me. They've written notes. They've shared my story. They've posted on my blog. They've sent in money. They've dropped off gifts, cooked, changed kids' diapers, carpooled kids. I have never felt so loved and covered in prayer. My heart may explode. The incredible outpouring of love and support that comes from Christian community can be transformative. And what a bold statement, right? That she's never felt so loved. That in this, what should be her darkest hour, God's love is more present. She feels more loved than ever in her life. This beautiful Christian community surrounding her with love and support is also a testimony to the surrounding world. Her friend Lauren shares... As I drove through Aaron's neighborhood recently, I was completely overcome with how many people adore their family. Their neighborhood is covered in purple mailbox bows and shows support and solidarity. Thousands of people are standing with them, waging hope. It is incredible to bear witness to this community of kindness and love that surrounds them. The kingdom of God, a supportive community of love where no need is unmet, where there is peace, where there is comfort, provision, God's grace. But even deeper than the external taste of paradise that Aaron experiences through love of family and friends is how God is using all of this to do an internal work of her experience in paradise. As God is using this to free her from the false promises of the world and allowing her to experience his love more deeply more powerfully. On February 20th, we see this process of victory, of freedom, of paradise that we sing about. She says, I feel like I was constantly looking for bigger and better things to plan and do, to decorate, to buy, better ways to eat and look the way I wanted to. I know I was focused on those things because I'm human. We all have the tendency to compare, seldom completely satisfied by what God has given us. But I can say that my normal days are different now. I see more gifts from others and from God than I ever had before my diagnosis. I'm not searching for things to bring me joy because I know things cannot do that. Only my God. And only the people that he put here for me can bring me joy. God and people. This outpouring of goodness to us just fills me up. Fills me up in my bad weeks. And it continues to make me want to fight like hell. More and more in the midst of her struggle, she's experiencing God's love. She's experiencing the reality of the evil. More and more love is experienced as more and more she is free from the desire, the need to create paradise on her own. Something which we all try to do and ultimately we all fail, right? She's a beautiful and incredible testimony to me and hopefully to you of the power of faith and of God's love. As this criminal reaches out to Jesus longing to be remembered, longing in his despair for a glimpse of hope for his future, he finds great hope in Jesus with the promise of paradise for his future. 
maternal acceptance and love. But church, I bet that in that moment of acceptance and love from Jesus, even in that moment on the cross, that things begin to change for him. That in his suffering, he started to experience peace that comes from love, that comes from grace. And church, this is the final message I want uh, to leave with us today. God wants us to experience paradise here and now through a community of love that is filled with God's love. This is how we, the church, move and change the world. This is how we bring people closer by this radical grace, this radical love to a relationship with God. I haven't forgot about that other criminal. The other criminal on the cross mocks Jesus. Tells him to come down if he's really God. Rejects his claim of Messiah. And what's remarkable to me is not what Jesus says, but what Jesus doesn't say. Jesus is the only one who's blameless. The only one, therefore, who can cast judgment. Who has the right to condemn. And as he is mocked and rejected, he had every right to lash out. He had every right to condemn. He had every right to threaten him with the hell. But he doesn't. He doesn't. Instead, he turns to his friend, his comrade, and he offers paradise. Instead, he gives an example of grace, of unconditional love to someone else. And church, I wonder if in that moment, with the three of them grasping for breath, holding on for maybe another hour, if that thief who historically has been called unrepentant, who many have said is an example of what happens, of punishment, we don't know. Isn't there a chance that because he wasn't condemned, that he was moved, that he was changed, that he as well accepted Christ, accepted this love? We don't know, but it is a beautiful model that Jesus sets for us of how to draw people in. Not by fear, not by judgment, not by threats of punishment, as the Romans do, as the world does, but by showing grace and love to all. It's love that moves hearts. It's grace that changes lives. Jesus' call is not to judge, but to love in the same way that we have been loved, so that people around us, people in our community, people all over the world who are struggling and in need get a taste of paradise as they experience God's grace. And that as they taste it, they want and long for even more. Will you pray with me, church? Lord God, we give you all glory and honor this morning. We thank you Thank you, thank you for your grace that allows us to be in relationship with you, to experience your love, and allows us that through that love to experience right relationship with one another. God, we pray in this season of Lent that you would continue to draw us closer to you, and as you do, you would continue to refine us, to shape us, to make us more and more a community of love, a picture of Eden so that the rest of this world may know and experience your love and want to know and experience you more deeply. We thank you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Stand and sing one more time as we lift up the name of a wonderful and faithful God who offers us his mercy and grace throughout all of us. It's your faithfulness, oh God. You wrestle with the sinner's restless heart. You lead us by still waters into mercy. And nothing can keep us apart. So remember your Remember your
Thank you. 